Lord be with you. I'm assuming by your response that means that you hear me. Okay, good. The story that we are looking at this morning as we begin our journey in Lent, a journey that some say is a process of looking deep at our lives and seeking to make things right as we march toward into Holy Week, the death and the resurrection of Christ. We have a period of time in which we can reflect upon our lives. We could see areas that we might classify as um, sin, addictions that we might want to deal with. We are called as a people to do one of two things, either to give up something that maybe is keeping us from being um, God's man or woman in the world. And so we give up things. Sometimes it says, well, I'm going to give up writing letters to my mom. That's not a good thing. <laughs> a good thing might be I'm going to give up uh, uh, caffeine or anything like that, something that is, is uh, problematic in your life, if that is so. Um, but also we want you to think about putting on things. Could be that you'd rather not do the negative, but you want to put on something. And so during Lent, you're going to be uh, volunteering more at maybe the, uh, uh, the food shelf or to help other people or to be very aware of your neighbor or to spend time in prayer and scripture more than you have been, to put on something that leads you into the heart of God. So today we're back in the garden with those primary questions in a story that is foundational to our life. Story of humanity in the garden. The word Adam means humanity. So if we could just kind of understand that this is to be applied to all the human family of this Adam and Eve in the garden, in this what we call paradise, in this place of perfect living in which they could eat of anything in the garden. And the Lord God says, here's one thing I want you to do. This is the first command of all scripture. I want you to serve and protect the garden. I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to uh, look at this not freshly, but look at it as the story stands, trying to take all of the stuff we're imposing upon the story. For instance, did you know in the story of, of Eden, there is no word for sin. Sin is not mentioned. Did you know that in this story, temptation is not mentioned, the word. Temptation is not there. That the word fall, as in the fall of man, is not there. These are words that are read into the story. So as we think of, well, how do we get to the mess that we are in terms of the world? What do, how does this story work to give us wisdom, perspective, and I'm going to uh, have maybe a, a very different perspective on this. I don't see it as that Eve was tempted by a snake who we have associated with the devil. There it is. <laughs> Some of you have been wanting me to speak on the devil. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> And, and that she uh, was tempted and she evaluated that it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's good, it's food, and it's uh, desirable to make me wise. Yeah, why not? I'm going to go ahead. And then she gave it to her husband. Do you know how much pain has been cost for womanhood because of this story? Because women have been blamed throughout the centuries with being the source of the fall of man. It was the woman's fault. Adam said clearly it was the woman's fault. She tempted me. And, and so, therefore, women should not have any sort of great voice anymore because they are tempting things all the time. Amen? Okay, for those at home, I did not get one amen out of this. <laughs> so we know this story very well. But at the beginning of the story, it talks about, it has a, the word Lord God. The Lord God 
gave one command. The Lord God did this. But as soon as the snake enters in, the snake being usually the word crafty, knowledgeable, but part of God's good creation, the snake came in and did not use the word Lord God. Lord is a, uh, uh, a word that is substituted for the word Yahweh. Yahweh God. The snake just said God. Didn't God say you could eat any of the, what's, what's going on? You won't die. God is not going to kill you if you eat of this. And even Eve talks about God, not Yahweh God. I think the core of understanding this scripture is in that. Going from Yahweh God, Yahweh is the very meaning of it is I am present with you. I am here with you. I am your very life. If you take Yahweh out of God, then you have something that you could attach your own stuff to. You can project anything on. God has wants us as a culture to go over to Africa and to enslave people and to bring them back to work our lands. God wants us as a nation to take the lands from native people, to take lands from the Mexicans and call it things, wonderful things like Texas and New Mexico. God can be used and manipulated so that we are in control of the creator. But as soon as we put Yahweh back into it, everything changes. Yahweh is a presence in the present moment calling us to do two things, to serve and to protect the garden. That is the number one command in scripture that has never been obliterated. It holds for us today, and it is always to be seen and interpreted in the present moment. The question for Lent is always, are we as a people, am I as a person under God, under Yahweh God, am I protecting, am I serving creation in all of its forms? That's it. As soon as you separate Yahweh from God, oh my gosh, there's infinite manipulations, infinite man ways that we can then destroy each other and hurt each other. The category of, of uh, protecting and serving creation also is applied to human social structures. To serve each other is a service and protection of creation. It's all lumped up into that one command. How many Star Trek fans are out there? <laughs> okay, a few. Have you ever been to a, a convention? So you're not a true Trekkie. You're just like, you like the show. Okay, I love the show. I was a kid when it came out and I thought it was the most amazing thing. And the more then we grew with the, show, the, the other shows that were based on Star Trek and the movies, they deepened the narrative, the mythology of this. It started out in the 60s to show basically what the beloved community could look like. If you remember on the deck, you would have an African-American woman in communications. You even had a Russian man, Chekhov, navigating the ship. You had all these things that were potentially from a very harmed and very aggressive, sometimes former enemies together on the ship. And they were under one order from Starfleet Command. It was called the Prime Directive. If you could remember that, they would bring it up almost constantly because they were going exploring all sorts of civilizations, all sorts of alien life forms. The prime directive basically stated it was non-interference with other cultures, that we cannot go in and impose our technology, our values, all of that upon another culture. That would be wrong. The cultures have to be able to evolve on their own. The prime directive, the number one order. In the Christian Jude uh, Jewish tradition, 
our prime directive is to serve and to protect creation. That has never been taken away from us. That is the purpose of our humanity. When we disassociate that, all of a sudden we can lift up and say the purpose of creation is human life. That we are somehow the pinnacle of creation. The prime directive of scripture says no. We are part of it. And we are to be a serving vehicle of God's love and largesse in the created order. One of the shows, uh, a spin-off that was supposed to be a prequel to, to Star Wars, uh, uh, the captain at that time, Jonathan Archer, uh, was making a statement. This was before they had the prime directive. He said, he said someday somebody's going to create a doctrine for us, something that as we go out and explore, that holds us back from manipulation so that we don't overimpose ourselves upon others. That there must be some sort of a doctrine. And until that time comes, every day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to remind myself not to play God. What we have here in the story of the garden is a picture of life without Yahweh. Life without that deep relationship that expresses what justice is all about. That expresses what our care of the world is all about. That even the little things like what we have done recently is that we would rather choose to buy in a grocery store uh, products that have some sort of, of, of symbol that says that they are fair trade. Instead of going for the uh, cheapest coffee or the cheapest chocolate or the cheapest bananas, which we love to see on sale, we know that because we buy so cheaply that others suffer, that other, others are not being paid a full wage and their families are suffering. They're being paid 67 cents an hour in South America because I want those cheap bananas. And so we are willing to pay a little bit more. Why? Because it's not just God, it's Yahweh God. I am present. I am opening up your imagination. I am showing that you are so deeply connected to all of life, all of living, to all of creations, to the rivers, to the oceans, to the sky. This is your prime directive. Now, it gets messed up when we just say, I want a theoretical God that I can manipulate and therefore I am going to be able to say nationalism is good. Nationalism because we have to protect our national interest. I'm going to say that individualism is great and grand because I should have the freedom to be able to impact whatever I want to do. That companies, corporations should not have restriction because we should just trust that they have everybody's interests in mind and not worry about it. You have, this is the temptation, you see, is to be able to have ourselves playing God, determining what is wise, determining for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And God said, when you eat of that fruit, you'll become like us, knowing good and evil meaning that you will become as God and not in subservience to the prime directive of caring for each other. So this is the call for us as we go into Lent to think deeply, reflectively, about how we have messed up and are unaligned with this. How we can create ourselves into that dynamic of God's love and we understand that Jesus comes to fulfill in a way the prime directive of caring of loving of reconciling creation and social order Jesus comes as the one to say the most important thing I have to offer is my shed blood 
my broken body, which is there to heal all of the harm that has been done when individuals and corporations and nations seek their own sense of themselves as a god and impose that upon others. The devastation, the way we treat each other. Jesus takes that, puts himself in the middle of the garden as the fulfillment and say, this is the way forward. I am Yahweh in your presence. The face of God, the face of Jesus. To trust in Christ Jesus is to fulfill the prime directive. Because if it's just, uh, I, am, I have Jesus in my heart and I'm happy, we are nowhere near the prime directive. It has to be where I then know if I'm going to trust Jesus with my life. I need to help, or I need to participate in the healing and the serving and the protective protection of all of creation, including my neighbor next door. This is the call of Christ upon us as we enter the season of Lent, to think deeply as we open up our Apple computers and we see in the Apple there's a bite taken off and we know that the Apple Corporation purposely chose that as the image. The bite of the apple. It's now humanity's turn to rule the roost. Our invitation is that there is no hope in that. The hope that we have is to serve and to love, to reconcile and to heal. Let us go into this Lent with this in mind. Amen.